Um, so tonight we're going to continue our series, um, Stronger, like we have been talking about for the past couple weeks. And um, tonight I want to talk about a topic um, that maybe you guys um, are interested in. I, I know that I would have been as a young man. I would have really wanted to know. I want to talk about how to be stronger than your enemies. How to be stronger than your enemies. All right, because who doesn't want to be stronger than your enemies? Who doesn't like the idea right, of being stronger than your enemies? Who doesn't like going to the movies and voting for that hero, right, to just get in that final duel with the villain and just, you know, beat them? You know what I mean? Just, like, beat them into submission. Every superhero movie is like that. Almost every action movie is like that, where they're, they defeat their enemies by simply being stronger and by using brute force or maybe even their intelligence, all right? And so um, sometimes, um, I, every time I kind of I think of this idea of coming up against an enemy, right? I always have this one particular clip in mind. And Jake, if you could play that clip. Um, and this is what I always think of when I am considering, uh, man, how to defeat or be stronger than your enemies. You guys got that? Enough! You are all of you beneath me. I am a god, you dull creature. And I will not be bullied by that. God. I mean, when I first saw, <laughs> when I first saw that, um, that scene in the theaters, there was just like this massive eruption of applause. Everybody loved it. I loved it. Who, who didn't love that scene when I first saw it? Um, and, uh, and, but I bring that up because, man, there's something kind of satisfying about that. We all have to admit it. He's the villain. He's the bad guy. He got what's coming to him, and the Hulk comes in and just destroys him, right? Um, and I, I'm going to take a wild guess that um, some of you either have, have had um, somebody in your life that, or, or somebody in your life that you just always maybe didn't really get along well with, right? And, and maybe they haven't always treated you well. Um, maybe um, you're in a feud with somebody. Maybe, um, maybe, maybe they've purposefully antagonized you. Maybe they've bullied you. Maybe they've harassed you. Maybe they've come after you. Maybe they just don't like you for any good reason at all. Maybe, maybe they just get under your skin, right? And, and whatever they have done, maybe they have hurt you or embarrassed you, fill in the blank, right? All of us have probably had somebody in our life that has done something similar to that. And if you haven't yet, um, congratulations on making it this far in life. Um, you will run into that person, and when you do, come see me. I'll be the first to welcome you to planet Earth, because guess what? That's just how life works. Not everybody we, we interact with we're going to get along with. That's just unfortunate. It's the reality um, of, of, this, of this problem that we have from being both sinful people and living in a sinful world. As a result of our sin, it, there's, there's broken relationships that come into play. We're broken people. They're broken people. You put the two together, one of us is going to probably walk away hurt inevitably, right? That's just how it works. It's not how God intended. It's, it's a problem, but it is unfortunately a reality that you and I have to work our way through. And here's the other reality, guys, is sometimes we're going to be the ones on the other side of things. Sometimes we're going to be the ones that either intentionally or unintentionally hurt other people. All right, and again, this is just the bad news. This is the reality of sin. This is what we have to do. And unfortunately, with sin, it kind of leaves us in this cycle of broken relationships, of one pain where I get hurt from somebody, and then I hurt somebody, and then they hurt somebody, and the cycle just continues. It's this really broken, it's this broken cycle of sin. It kind of leaves this um, void, kind of leaves injustice in the air, right? We all have to deal with it. And unfortunately, sometimes it even leads to the formation of, of enemies. So my question tonight, because God has an answer to this, is, man, how are we as Christians supposed to respond to this cycle of broken relationships? How are we supposed to play our part in this? And how does God want us to be stronger, and quote, unquote, our enemies? So what I like to do is when I, when I want to see how God wants us to behave, is I have to first look to the character of God, because he's always our standard for character. So I always look at the, at the character of God. Now, here's what I love about God, and here's why he's worth taking advice from, all right? Did you guys know that God is the strongest being that has ever existed, exists today, and will ever exist for eternity? 
Like, he is the absolute strongest. We're in a series right now called Stronger, where God is going to try to shape us and make us stronger. You know why we can listen to God? Because he is literally the strongest being that has ever existed, will ever exist. And here's what I also love about God. Did you guys know that he's undefeated? That there's not a single battle that he has ever lost. He is always victorious. He always knows how to win. So whenever I'm looking for advice from somebody, I want to know, well, what's your track record? Why should I take my advice from you? Why should I model my life after you? Well, this is why. God's the strongest, and he's he's undefeated. And there was this moment in history, and you guys know this, where God became man because he wanted to teach humanity who he is and how to be like him. And obviously, we call this man Jesus. And just a little fun side note. Do you guys, does anybody know what Jesus means? Do you guys know what Jesus means, the name Jesus? It's the Hebrew word Yeshua, and it means God is salvation. God is salvation. Jesus came to be our salvation. But um, Jesus, right, he came to reveal who God is and who God wants us to be. And he also wants us to be stronger just like him and how to walk in victory. And so one day, he, he gathered all these sorts of people, thousands of people, And he begins to teach um, on this hillside, and he begins to teach them about something that he calls the kingdom of God. Or what I'm going to call it for us, just for the simplicity of today, he's teaching about a new way to live, a new way of living, something that's modeled after God's character. And in this message about the kingdom, Jesus brought up the topic of enemies. He actually begins to start talking about it. Now remember that in the time of Jesus' life on earth, It was the same sin problem. It was the same issues. The same brokenness spilled into individuals, into our personal relationships, but also into our societal relationships, into our governments, into the world, right? Sin is a problem at every single sociological level. It was just as prevalent back then, so he had to deal with the same stuff. He still saw people fighting with one another, with hating one another. He saw people inflicting pain on other people. He saw people trapped by the pain that they had received from other people. He saw injustice, and as a result, he saw the formation of enemies amongst people. And also remember this, that Jesus lived in a really um, difficult time period. He lived in the era of the Roman government, at the height of the Roman government, this Roman empire, right? And the Romans, they were violent oppressors of Jesus's fellow Israelites. They were violent oppressors and what's unique about, um, about, this, about this moment is Jesus is going around, right? And he's talking about um, himself as the son of God, as the king that was promised, as the Messiah. So people kind of listen to him because they're curious to know, okay, what's this guy have to say? And there was, uh, there was an expectation of the Messiah at that time that they assumed that then when the Messiah would come, he would come as a conqueror and would liberate them from the Roman Empire. So they're expecting the Messiah to come and just lay waste to their enemies. You know what I mean? Just come in and brute force, push them out, elevate Israel. Kind of like the Hulk, just what he did to Loki right there two seconds ago. Come in, establish his dominance, and then just kind of move on, right? So when Jesus is preaching and they're kind of listening to what he has to say in Matthew 5, 38 through 48, if you guys would turn with me, in this long sermon he's preaching, he touches up on this idea of enemies. And just think about this, right? He brings this topic up. This is a really relevant situation to their personal lives. It's a really relevant situation to their political lives. It's a really relevant situation to their spiritual lives. So they were trapped. When he said, when he started talking about the enemies, they were glued because they wanted to hear what they had to say. So in Matthew 5, verses 38 through 48, Jesus says this, you have heard that it was said Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt your, and ha- uh, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. And when you skip ahead in the verses, he, there's this topic in verse 43 where he talks about love for enemies, and he says this, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? 
Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So, wow, Jesus, he flips the script there, doesn't he? Um, Jesus is redefining what it means to be stronger than your enemy. Before it was, you hurt me, I hurt you, right? You insult me, I insult you back. You hit me, I hit you. And usually it's, you hit me, I hit you harder to end it, right? That's how it would work. But now it's, you hit me, and I turn the other cheek. You insult me, and I speak nothing but blessings to you. You hurt me, I forgive you. And this is really uncommon in that day, and guess what? It's still uncommon today. That's why I love what Jesus said in verse 46. If you only love those who love you, what good is that? Right? Even scoundrels do that much. If you're friendly to only your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even the heathens do that. So that's still something common today. If we're only friendly to those who are friendly to us, how are we different? Um, If we're only kind to those that we know, that we trust, that are kind to us, what separates us? If anything, that doesn't make us strong. It actually just makes us weak, just like everybody else. And here's the other thing. His call to love your enemies... And in his call to turn the other cheek, to give blessings for curses, to take the blows, to forgive, to be kind. You guys notice how difficult and uncomfortable that is, right? Because, Jake, I couldn't imagine that if somebody walked up to you at school and in the middle of everybody, for no reason, just slapped you in the face. Right? I have a hard time imagining that you're going to walk away with a smile on your face. Like, oh, that was cool. No. No. It's going to be difficult. You're going to be embarrassed, right? If somebody comes and starts spreading rumors about you girls and word gets around and they start insulting you behind your back, I have a hard time thinking that you guys are going to walk away saying, oh, it's okay. They're so sweet. Like, I love them. It's going to be really, really hard. It's really difficult. It's uncomfortable, right? So what Jesus is doing is he's actually raising the standard here. And if you read this verse and you think to yourself, man, that's really, really hard. That's really difficult. That's not the response I want to have. Can I tell you something? That's exactly his point. That's what he wants. Because he follows it up and he says, you must be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect. If the standard wasn't hard enough, then he backs it up to something impossible. And he says, no, no, no. You have to be perfect like I am perfect, like my heavenly father is perfect. Here's what you guys have to understand. When we talk about this concept of loving your enemies, of being kind and blessing those who persecute you, of turning the other cheek, of going the extra mile, of showing grace where it's not deserved any. You have to understand that what Jesus is trying to do, he's trying to get the attention of the crowd to make them realize that their standard of love falls incredibly short from God's standard of love. He's trying to make them understand that their standard of what it means to be a good person isn't even close to what it means to be God's standard of good. That's why he says, you have to be perfect, just like I am perfect, just like my heavenly Father is perfect. He's trying to make you realize that you cannot please God and achieve his standards without his help. It's as simple as that. Because he's later going to go on to even talk about this, that um, you can't even make it to heaven without God's help. You can't even do anything without God's help. So we first have to realize this, and we talked about this the first week, that we have to know where our strength comes from in order to move forward and grow stronger as Christians. We have to know that in order to love like Jesus, we need the desperate help of Jesus. We can't do that in our own strength. We're not capable of doing that. There's no amount of willpower. There's no amount of um, just strength that I can muster up in myself to love my enemies the way Jesus has called me to do. It's a near impossible standard, and he's trying to let you know that you can't do it by yourself. You need my help to do it. He's trying to make you uncomfortable because he's trying to make you realize how desperate you are in need of his help and his transformation. So how do we love our enemies? I just said it. We can't love like Jesus without the help of Jesus. Jesus says this in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. And this is what he, this is really, really important. For apart from me, 
for apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. For apart from me, you can do nothing that could ever even be close to meeting the standard of God's love and goodness and perfection that he has called us all to be. Why? Because we're sinful people. My life is already messed up. I'm guilty of that hurt. I'm guilty of causing pain. I'm guilty of not responding to it correctly. My life is a mess. Apart from Jesus, I can't do anything. I need his desperate help to meet that standard of love that he has called us to be. So first, we have to realize that if we ever want to love our enemies the way he has called us to do, we need his help. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. We need his transformative power. I can't do that in my own strength. Number two, how do we love our enemies? And this is a really big one, guys. And, and you guys know me enough. This is good. Um, we're close enough. You know that um, I, have, I, I care nothing about the best for you guys, so please don't um, take what I'm saying right now to be really harsh. But we really, really need to recognize that love is not determined by your feelings or your emotions. It's not. That's a common misconception that I think we're taught a lot in life, in media, and what we watch, that somehow my love is connected to how I feel. If I have good feelings towards you, I love you, right? If I feel good about that person, I love them, right? But take a look at some of these scenarios that Jesus laid out. Somebody slaps you, Jake. How are you going to feel? You're not going to feel really loving towards that person, right? Yeah, at least how we would define it, right? Um, somebody wants to take all of your things, Alora, by force for an unjustifiable reason. How are you going to feel? Yeah, you're not going to feel really great, are you? Um, somebody, um, Lorelai, they force you by threat of prison to do their work for them. How are you going to feel about that? Which, by the way, that's what the Romans did. If you guys didn't know the second mile, when he says go the extra mile, it's because um, under Roman law, a soldier could pull on you, Sky, for no reason and say, carry my gear for a mile. And by the way, this is heavy Roman imperial gear. It's almost like 100 pounds, right? And you had nothing to do. They didn't care about how your day was going, where you were going. They didn't care about interrupting your life. I got to get home to the kids. I don't care. Carry my stuff. And if you don't, I'll throw you in prison. That was actually really common back then. Somebody's persecuting you guys. They're insulting you. They're hurting you. They're excluding you. How is that going to make you feel? It's not going to feel great. But that doesn't remove the call to love them, which tells me this, right? My call to love is not determined about how I feel and my emotions. Think about Jesus' crucifixion for a moment. Because Jesus is the one setting this standard, right? Let's see how he lives it out. Think about everything he went through in that process of being unjustly trialed and then transferred to being tortured, to being rejected by his friends, to being abused, and to ultimately being murdered on a cross. And in the midst of that murder, in the midst of his pain and of his suffering, that whole process, he's not feeling really good. He cries out to God, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That tells me this, that how he was feeling had no correlation to his call and his standard of love. Clearly, right, feelings do not determine God's standard for love. And I also want to remind you guys that our feelings, our emotions, they're a part of who we are. And, but they're always intended to complement our healthy relational experience with God and with others. That's what they were created for. They're meant to come alongside. But the moment that you and I fell short to sin, that means that our responses, our emotions got whacked too, which means that I don't always respond the right way. I don't always have the healthy feelings towards this moment. I don't always have the correct uh, perspective on what is taking place. Which means that we just got to trust and be obedient. Now, this has been kind of tough so far, so let me talk about some good things, though. Here's the, the good thing, and here's what God promises. He promises this, that obedience will produce the right response. Because I don't know about you, when I do go through difficult times, I don't want it to just all be like, well, I guess God doesn't care about my feelings at all. No, no, no. God's spirit is still true. He still wants you to walk in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. He still desires you to have those quality traits as you're walking through these difficult moments. And he promised to be the one to come alongside you and give you those things. However, it's obedience that will produce those results in your life. It's obedience that will lead to the fruit of the Spirit that we're going to read with right now. Here's what Galatians 5 says. 
But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. It's sexual immorality, it's impurity, it's sensuality, it's idolatry, it's sorcery, it's enmity, it's strife, it's jealousy, it's fits of anger, it's rivalries, it's dissensions, it's divisions, it's envy, it's drunkenness, it's orgies, and it's things like these that I warned you about. And I warned you about before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow, that was one heck of a list, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faith, or goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh in its passions and its desires. Okay, so that was a long verse. I wanted us to focus on verse 16 and verse 22. But I say, walk by the Spirit. I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit is simply this. Walk in obedience to what God has commanded you. That, that's what it means to walk by the Spirit. I'm walking in the obedience and the surrender of God's leading in my life. I'm obeying his commandments. That's what it means to walk by the Spirit. And the fruit of that, the fruit of my obedience to what he has called me to do is this. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Which tells me this, in that moment, when somebody hurts me and I want to respond, my call is to be obedient to the standard of love that God has called us to walk in. It's not going to feel good at the moment. It's going to be really, really hard at the moment. And the reality is I can't even do that without Christ's help in the beginning. I need his strength in order to do that. But his promise is when you walk by the Spirit, when you are led by the Spirit, when you obey my commands, not only will I supply you the strength to do what I've called you to do, but then one of the gifts that I'm going to produce in your life from that moment, therefore, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Because I don't know about you, anytime I get hurt, I need some love in my life. Anytime somebody is mean to me, I need to get some joy restored to my life. Anytime I'm going through something really hard and difficult, I need more patience in my life. Anytime somebody is coming after me, I need kindness in my life. Anytime I, I experience the taste and sting of evil, I need more goodness in my life. And God promises that when you obey me and you obey my standard of love, you lay your initial reactions, your initial feelings to the side and be obedient to me, I will come alongside and I will give you these fruits of the Spirit, these qualities that I know you need. That's his promise. So here's, here's the cool thing. And this is what also helps makes us stronger, and then I'll close it. Loving in the midst of of difficulty increases our capacity to love like Jesus. Loving in the midst of difficulty increases our capacity to love like Jesus. Jesus wants to transform you into, the, into his image and to be the people that you're always created to be. And one of those qualities is this, your ability to greatly love somebody else in the midst of them wounding you, hurting you, or going through difficult times. Why? Because that's the quality that he displayed for you and I in his life and on his death on the cross. It's a quality that reveals that you are actually stronger than your enemies, not because you beat them by brute force, but because all the hate that they pour into you, you can still stand strong and, send and, re and respond in love. That's a sign that, man, you are a strong and mature Christian, that he's doing his good work in your life. And here's the other thing, right? I want you guys to know this. It's a process. It's a process. It always is. Life always is. Think of it this way, right? Fruits of the Spirit. Think of a fruit tree, right? My grandpa's growing um, lemon and lime trees out in his backyard, and when you go back here, it's kind of cool. They have like, these like, small little lemons and limes. You can see them growing, right? Well, they're not huge and fat like we're used to. Why? Because the tree's not big enough yet. It's still in the process of growing. It's still in the process of being shaped. It's still in the process of being developed, and when we say yes to God during these moments when life is hard, when somebody comes against me and I'm obedient, he promises to produce fruit. Really what he's doing is he's growing my ability to, and he's growing my, my character to reflect more and more like Jesus. 
And the longer you go through this process, because we're all going to make mistakes, we're all going to stumble, we're all going to fall, we're going to fall short in our sin, and we're going to fall short in how we respond to others. But his promise is that eventually, right, you're going to start from a little budling that's growing a tiny little fruit into a large tree planted by streams of water that is growing fruit in a flourishing capacity, right? Where now your grace isn't just a tiny little, you know, little sprout. It's actually, it's developed, it's, it's shaped that's what God wants in your life. It's going to take time. It's going to take process. But we just need to remember that God is shaping our character. Um, I'm going to close with this. And I'm going to pray over you guys. And then we can be dismissed. Romans 12, 17 through 21 says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful, what, uh, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let me pray over you guys. Lord, we just thank you um, for your goodness. We thank you, God, that you came to reveal your standard of goodness, your standard of love in our lives. We thank you, Father, that despite our sin, despite all the pain that we have caused you in our lives, you continually forgive. You have new mercy for us every day. Father, your love is unfathomable. And I pray that you continue to teach us and guide us and show us how to love like you revealed to us through your son, Jesus. I pray, Father, that you continue to increase our capacity for goodness in our life and kindness and love and gentleness and mercy and patience. We thank you, Lord, and I pray this, Father, that we would always remember our dependency on you to be our strength for our faith, Lord. We can't do anything apart from you. Father, we desperately need you in every single moment, in every single situation. I pray, God, that we would always remember how hopeless we are without your help so that we would just run to you sooner and hang with you longer and cling to you longer, Lord. We need you. We need your work. Father, I pray blessings over these students. As they go about their lives, some of them are going back to hybrid classes. Some of them are going staying online. Lord, there's just a, there's just difference. There's just something new right now going on in each of our lives. And I just pray that you be with them. Be with them during the confusing times, the frustrating times. And, Father, I just pray that you just uh, continue to give them uh, the, the confidence, the perseverance, um, and the joy that they need in order to go about their good work. And, Father, I just again pray your blessings over their families. In Jesus' name, amen.